just to pick up on the points that were outstanding from before the short journey, um, <clears throat> the, the first one is that um, we were asked a question about whether there's a formal document um, about an irremovability of somebody who's a potential victim has had a positive reasonable grounds decision. The answer is, as far as we can tell, it is the reasonable grounds decision letter. Um, that, of course, is generated by the Home Office. And if there were any question of removability, it's the Home Office that would do it. So, so that would But the matter. letter doesn't say, I mean, well, somewhere, I don't know how many paragraphs there are, and it's <coughs> not very many, but there is the paragraph saying the result of this is that you may not be removed. And uh, your conclusive grounds. No, we, we don't think it does say that. But, um, but the, the, the fact that the letter has been issued shows that there's, there isn't going to be an attempt made to remove the person because. Um, uh, they, uh, it, it would be the same department that would do it, and they clearly know that um, the person. I understand not that, but third parties might want to know. Might, might there. There doesn't seem to be any reason why a third party would need to know whether the person is removable or not. Give me a moment. Just have it. Stay down. I've got a screen issue. Told you should never rely on technology. Um, I'll, man I'll, I'll manage if you can get another screen. Mm -hmm. Like so many things in life, pros and cons. All pros, Mr. Tam. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I'll manage. Oh, great. <coughs> um, Lord, the, the second thing was that uh, we were asked to find the reference in our skeleton uh, about where we deal with the, the question of what stay means. Yes. It's a section from 11.7 to 11.13. It starts in core bundle page 36. And it's to do with the textual analysis. <coughs> Starting second, and, and that, that the whole whole thing is to do with the textual analysis of, of Article 14. Yes, really, you say it's that, but it, this particular point is 11.7, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. Second, second, second half. But the, 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 the nature of treaty interpretation is that there are always different ways you can look at the, the phrase. 
phrasing of the, the treaty. It's, um, as the authorities say, it's not, a, not the way you would read a common law statute. Um, and that's why we, we have looked at it in, in several different ways. They all come with that flavour of Article 14.1 being concerned with something longer term than the purely interim kind of leave that, for which KTT was contending. Um, <clears throat> the third thing was whether there were any policy commitments specifically relating to Article 14. We have not been able to find any so far. Uh, I'm sure that if learned friends do, they will, they, they will tell us, um, but I thought that I should update the court on that. And the fourth was um, not a question from the court, but simply a, a matter of, um, uh, of form, which I was going to deal with when I dealt with funders. Um, Mr. Justice Mostyn's decision has been reported in the weekly rule reports. Um, the bundles only have the transcript, but we're, we're, we've got copies of the weeklies if anybody would like to have them. Um, <clears throat> Lords, just before the short adjournment, I have been looking at ver the version 2 of the policy. Um, there is just one last thing to say about that. So could I please ask to turn up policy bundle 2, um, tab 11, um, page, well, can I go back to 625, 626, which is where we were? <coughs> um, I made the point um, that this predated the change um, between always having the uh, asylum decision first and DL decision second. Um, uh, and uh, that was the reason for the way that um, 625 and then uh, 626, paragraph 2, just above the three bullet points, were drafted. If you go on to page 631... <coughs> Sorry, you're in the, in the policy bundle? Oh, policy bundle, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you want to go to 631? 631, um, where there is a more specific um, provision there. It's the uh, fourth paragraph, immediately below the three bullet points. Um, <clears throat> uh, all outstanding asylum decisions should be taken before any consideration is given to whether the victim is eligible for discretionary leave. The very short point is that in this version of the policy, there clearly was a contemplation. Um, <coughs> uh, or, I should put it the other way around. There was no contemplation. The policy could not have contemplated that DL would be granted for the purposes of making an asylum claim, that rule simply would not work in those circumstances. <clears throat> um, because I was asked whether there has been any change in the policy, can I just quickly show you the current version of the policy? This is going on in the policy bundle to page 1394. It's version 5. <clears throat> um, that's where it starts. Page 1398 is the start of the pa um, passage corresponding to what we've looked at before. <coughs> <clears throat> um, there's a heading near the bottom of the page, when to consider a grant, which is familiar. At 139... Sorry, sorry, grant. Yeah. First one, the version, where is it? Ver Ver version 5, it's version five, tab, yeah. tab 19, version 5, yes. starts at 1394, and then when to consider a grant is 1398. <coughs> um, <clears throat> 1399, you'll see that an edit has been made to the second paragraph, discretionary leave may be considered, because it's now removed that reference to doesn't qualify for another form of leave. But the section leave as necessary into personal circumstances remains the same. And then if you go on to 1403, you'll see what has come of the order in which um, decisions should be made. In the second paragraph on 1403, um, if the confirmed victim has an outstanding asylum claim um, and uh, support would not be withdrawn, then the asylum claim should normally be decided before any consideration is given to DL. So while it's no longer um, a rule in the terms uh, previously appearing, the 
this still contemplates normally that asylum will come first before consideration of DL. And so the policy on its face still um, doesn't contemplate that DL would be granted um, pending the uh, conclusion of the asylum claim. I'm just looking at the next paragraph. Although that's the what I said normally should be decided, he then goes on to give examples of ones where the grant of DL may be appropriate in advance of consideration of the asylum claims. Um, perhaps we without deciding how this works. It seems to me the examples rather overwhelm the, the exceptions, don't they? Sorry, the, exa the, the exceptions rather overwhelm the norm. Because these are the very cases in which they would normally be granted. Um, well, the, 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 they correspond yes, to... They, they, do, they do correspond um, um, because um, what is contemplated is that there may be cases where the call for a grant of DL, um, an early grant of DL, if I can call yes. it that, um, is strong enough that DL ought to be granted at that time, i.e. before the asylum claim has been, has been dealt with. Um, and so it's identifying the same sort of categories in which that might, um, that might occur. It's requiring, requiring the decision maker to make a prediction of the likely outcome. Uh, yes. Of, yes. Of well, not always. Not under the third option. But anyway, I, I regret having asked you about this. We don't have to decide it. It slightly puzzles me. But um, yes, I, 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 I don't want to fully argue no, this. No, no. But, but what I... Yes, I, I said it. But, well, may, may, may I just, just, just say one thing? It does reinforce the, um, uh, the the drafting of the policy, which is that it still contemplates DL being granted for some longer term substantive reason, and not a grant of DL on the sort of interim basis that KTT is on. Having said all that, having um, answered many questions about the, the, the steps that, uh, that I was going through, um, I think that what I can now do is to rattle through the, the submissions uh, in each case pretty swiftly, because many of the substantive submissions that I would make under each of these headings I've made already. Um, Apologise if I go too fast, but um, <laughs> let me uh, uh, let me do this uh, as efficiently as I can. Um, on EOG, where the focus is on Article 10.2, I've made the points about um, the negative obligations in the treaty in ECAT itself. Um, we do draw attention um, to the uh, um, analogy with the refugee. Uh, Article 33, you will find, I don't need to ask you to turn this up now, you will find in um, Authorities, uh, uh, Volume 2, at page 550. Sure, Article 33 of? Uh, refugee Convention. Of refugee Sorry, Convention. it's very familiar, so I, I don't need to ask to turn that up. But that's a negative obligation. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, if an ECHR claim is made, then we, there is statutory protection for individuals. Um, uh, in uh, I think section 94 of the 2002 Act that's not actually in the authority of funding but I don't think it's controversial um, <clears throat> and um, I've shown you the passages in the explanatory report that deal with article 10 um, where uh, the negative nature of the obligation is explained and there is no suggestion that um, uh, those who are here illegally must have their status regularised, uh, regularised in certain circumstances while the, the identification process is underway, because that's what EOG is about. So there's, there's nothing there. 
The contrast, <clears throat> um, again, I've just headlined these, where ECAT uh, itself wants to impose positive obligations, it, it uses language in which it does so. Um, the only wrinkle is that last sentence of Article 13.1, but I don't think I can take uh, that any further than I, I have done already. Um, and so the consequence is that um, in Article 10.2, there is nothing that um, compels, in any circumstances, a grant of leave to remain. The obligations are entirely negative, and they are obligations with which we clearly comply. And um, if uh, your lordships are with us on that, then that is a complete uh, um, uh, 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 answer to the uh, um, to Mr. Justice Mostyn's decision. To make good our criticism of what he did, can I just ask the court to look briefly um, uh, at it? Um, ju just a couple of paragraphs for the core of the decision. Um, <clears throat> the first is paragraph 42. It's in four bundle 104, the transcript. Um, the primary argument, um, uh, sorry, I, I should identify that the, 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 the secondary <coughs> argument was one about that last sentence of Article 13.1, which Mr. Justice Mostyn rejected. And then at 42, reverting to her primary argument, Ms. Weston submits that the absence of the grant of any kind of leave, however limited, to the beneficiary of reasonable grounds decisions, a fatal failure to implement the clear requirement not to remove such a person from the national territory as provided for in Article 10.2. Uh, and then um, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn refers to my Lord, Lord Justice Underhill's uh, judgment in Balajigari about criminalisation um, and, and so I'll just say, because it, um, I get this so often, if you look at the passage in question, I'm actually summarising the submissions of um, uh, 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 Mr. Bates of counsel I'm not saying any of it is wrong, but <laughs> I get rather fed up with being saying Underhill has okay, pronounced that. Anyway, it's a little court. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, I've dropped that off my chest. Yes, yeah, so I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm because I'm, you've I'm been right. drowned out by the uh, uh, somebody sent a helicopter <laughs> to make sure that you didn't get it. <laughs> well, um, Lord, uh, I promise that I will remember that every time <laughs> this, this this appears as, um, in Mr. Biggs's submissions, as recorded by the court in Balajigari. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but the, um, the, 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 the point about criminalisation is one that, that Mr Justice Boston then, that then does pick up. Um, and you see uh, that uh, after having worked through the, 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 the submissions at 48, his conclusion is that he agrees that there is an unlawful lacuna in the existing policy in as much as it fails to implement the obligation in 10.2 formally to protect persons in receipt of a positive reasonable grounds decision from removal from this country's national territory pending the conclusion of the process. Suffering such persons to remain as overstayers or as illegal immigrants does not fulfil the obligation. And we respectfully say that when you look at 10.2 in the context of all of the materials, um, clearly that is wrong, uh, not least because 10.2, um, part, that part of the, um, of the, the treaty, itself recognises that there will be many people falling within this category who are, by definition, overstayers, illegal entrants, and that it says nothing about regularising their position. Um, and uh, so um, this, we respect to say, is clearly wrong. Um, and uh, for that reason alone, we say that our appeal ought to succeed. I, I appreciate, Mr Tam, that this, this doesn't undermine the point you're making. But uh, it, is, it is factually correct, nevertheless, isn't it, that to be in the country without leave to remain is a criminal offence. Is that uh, when you need leave to remain? Um, I, 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 I don't think I could accept that as boldly as that. Um, however, I, I suspect the answer is a bit more complicated I than, see. Oh, well, than I, just that. Right. I have seen cases in which counsel in your position has said, uh, maybe acknowledged
approached in a more, more um, sophisticated, but in a more nuanced way that it is broadly a new defence, but says it, it will be an abuse if it's prosecuted. But, um, well, certainly, I, I, I think I, I um, can safely um, agree with the last part of yes. that, as, as indeed does Mr. Justice Mostyn, um, uh, where he exactly where he says it, but he, 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 he does say that, you know, um, he, it would be unlikely that the claim would actually be prosecuted. Yes, I see. Anyway. Yes, I see. Right, okay, so yeah, no, if, if it's not straightforward, that's not straightforward. Yes. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a sort of question which I hesitate to answer without having done the research. I'm no, no, <laughs> fair enough. The answer, I think fair enough. Well. But it is a point that's regularly deployed yes. in circumstances, yes. that it's very unfair that yes. someone who is allowed to be here uh, is, even though not having leave to remain, is in principle subject to be punished for it. But there we are. Um, yes, well, uh, and, and one understands the, the, the point. Um, I mean, fundamentally, that is the point being made by Mr. Biggs to your Lordship in Balochigari, as you yeah. mentioned, of course. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Yes, and it's, uh, I, I should say, what, while I've got this open, uh, just to uh, notice that it's from that that he uh, decides that um, the Secretary of State is obliged, must formulate, obliged to formulate a policy um, that grants such persons interim discretionary leave on such terms and conditions as are appropriate both to their existing leave positions and to the likely delay that they will face, not for me to prescribe what such terms and conditions should be. Um, uh, you would draw attention to the word interim as being directly contrary to what that part of the treaty is yes. about. Yes, oh yes, yes, de definitely. Um, can I just re return to this when I come to the right part of my submission? I, I, I draw attention to that is um, what the uh, what was being said there. Um, in the structure of our grounds in EOG, we, we've split out um, the, the grounds in, into four. Uh, grounds two and three, I think on analysis, are really additional reasons for supporting ground one. Can I deal with them quite quickly? Um, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the ground two argument is that um, this was also wrong because EOG's real complaint was about the delay in decision. And when Lord, Lord Justice, until put to me just a moment ago, the, uh, the argument about criminalisation and, uh, and how unfair it is argued to be that people might be put in the position of being criminalised and perhaps criminalised for a long period, the, the complaint is really one about the delay in the decision making. And we know that delay is challenging. Um, just within this context, there's O and H, which is in Authorities, uh, Volume 1, Tab 6, at page 196. Don't need to, to turn that up now, but that's a case. Sorry, what page was, number again? Uh, page 196, in the Authorities, um, <clears throat> where a direct challenge was made about delay, and clearly delay is a ground uh, of, of challenge. Um, and um, Mr. Justice Mostyn, um, uh, used as the starting point of, of his um, reasons um, the, the, the delays that were being complained of. That's paragraphs 36 to 38 of, of his decision. Um, but the, um, well, first of all, we say that if that's a real complaint, that is the, the avenue of complaint that should be made. Um, Learn from Ms. Weston, I think, uh, if I recall rightly, fairly recognised that it's quite difficult to succeed in such a um, but we respectfully say that even if it is, that is not a reason to throw, um, and I say this respectfully, um, uh, to, to, to throw the constitutional position out of the window and just say, um, therefore, the Secretary of State is in breach of Article 10.2 and must make a policy that, that people in this position be granted leave. Um, if, that was the, if delay is a real complaint, then that is what. 
The other subsidiary point, which we describe as ground three, relates to the personal circumstances of EOG herself. And this is very case specific. Um, we have um, today discussed the position of, um, at one extreme, British citizens who are here as of right, um, and at the, perhaps the other extreme, the overstairs illegal entrants, those who've been clandestinely um, smuggled into the country under duress and who have no right at all to be here. Within that spectrum of um, victims or potential victims of trafficking, um, uh, EOG herself happened to be in a particularly privileged position. Um, and, and that is because she had leave to enter uh, and uh, leave with permission to work. Uh, and that was because she was a Tier 5 Youth Mobility Scheme, the new name for what to know as working holiday makers. Um, and uh, at the time of the events um, that constituted trafficking, she'd been here for about six months. Um, I, I, I don't mean, and I hope this is not interpreted as casting any sort of moral judgment, but she chose a line of work which is known to be potentially dangerous. And unfortunately, for one week, she was subject to some really nasty criminal behavior. Um, but that was the extent of the trafficking involved. Uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn used the word eventually. He said, I think, eventually she escaped. It was, it was a week later. And she still had another 18 months left uh, uh, on her um, working holiday uh, youth mobility scheme visa. Um, we accept that it took a long time after her referral into the MR NRM for um, decisions to be made. But in the circumstances of her case, being, as she claimed, a, a victim of trafficking, she actually had some triggers that she could have used uh, which would have extended her extant leave um, by virtue of Section 3C. Um, obviously, it's not for us to to um, advise her what she should or could have done, um, <clears throat> but we have enumerated at least three routes by which she could have extended her leave by making an application for further leave, um, just, just so, so that you so they set out in the skeleton argument, but leave outside the rules. She could have made an asylum claim, or she could have made a claim under Article 4 of the ETHR. And it's the making of the application having been put into the NRM, uh, making the application which would have extended the leave in the, uh, in the interim. Um, there are two how points. Does this, how does this affect the argument of principle? There, no doubt you're right. There will be a class, quite a substantial class possibly, of victims of trafficking who, um, as you say, have levers they can pull have gone to renew their leave, not perhaps indefinitely, but for some time. Um, but that doesn't affect the Christian principle as regards to those who can't. On, on a purely abstract level, I, 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 I agree that that, that, that that must be the case. But there are actually two points here. One of them is that if you read Mr. Justice Mostyn's judgment, um, it is all couched in the language of the delay um, was a secretary of uh, the delay in the decision making was the cause of um, the deprivation of the OG's permission to stay, for her, her leave to enter, her right to work, and therefore she was cast out in, in, into the wilderness. We respect to say that wasn't actually an altogether accurate description of the consequences of that. But the, the, um, the other point, which is the, the, a broader point, relates to what um, the Secretary of State would have to do if the um, uh, order uh, that Mr. Justice Mostyn made had to be complied with, because he is talking about formulating policies for different classes of people, um, the, the status they had at the time, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And the, the fact that there are people who um, have leave, have permission to work, could extend that, um, but for one reason or other don't, um, uh, puts that um, uh, or makes that exercise an extraordinarily um, difficult one 
especially when there are people who could have created their own um, route to an interim form of leave while their, their status was being sorted out. But you uh, say it's a sledgehammer to crack it. Uh, yes, uh, in, uh, in many ways that's right, yes. So that's the, the, um, what comes out of that, but I accept it starts from a very case-specific point, and, and, and that's where you can put it. The, the fourth ground is uh, probably um, uh, more of a standalone point, and that is that in the relief that Mr Justice Mostyn ordered, um, he improperly trespassed into the uh, role of policy setting, um, which is for the Secretary of State to, to do. Um, uh, and um, uh, and therefore, he, he should not have gone there. Uh, one of the difficulties that is apparent from paragraph 48 uh, of the judgment um, is that it is not entirely clear how broadly the uh, right to this interim leave should be. Should it be everyone who has um, a positive reasonable grounds decision? Um, should it be people who've uh, been waiting for a certain length of time? Um, should it be only people who had leave to remain and, uh, and, and that has come to an end? Should it be only people who had the right to work, which has come to an end? We, we don't know. It's a bit opaque. Um, what, what Mr. Justice Mostyn said. Um, the, the, the point here um, is that um, if one is looking for uh, identifying different categories of people and how they should be dealt with uh, in these circumstances, that is um, classically a policy making exercise. Uh, and that is for the Secretary of State. Um, to set. There are lots of policy choices that would have to be made and across government there would be many different considerations to take into account. Um, but one of the things that could be a proper um, uh, outcome is a, a policy that doesn't actually grant leave to any people in this category if uh, Article 10.2 is complied with in other ways. There is a tension between um, uh, that um, and the converse position, which is if, and this is an if, if te Article 10.2 requires leave to be granted, then uh, really um, Mr Justice Mostyn wouldn't have needed to go through this exercise because if it was a legal requirement that leave be granted to this category of people, one would more naturally expect um, uh, the court to say leave needs to be granted and it would be unlawful not to do so. Um, and so in, in um, uh, formulating the relief that he did, um, we respectfully say that Mr Justice Mostyn did um, go into forbidden territory, uh, even within the purely domestic, um, uh, uh, the domestic legal structure. Um, Lords, I said that this would be the appropriate moment to deal with Article 4. I can do this quite briefly. Um, first of all, um, can I invite the court please to go to Authorities uh, Tab 9. This is Volume 1 in the paper of these, uh, page 275. <coughs> this court's decision in MN. Um, chaired by my Lord Lord Justice Underhill. Um, can I ask the court please to go to paragraph 43, which is at page 295. Um, there is a passage, I'm not going to read it all out, there's a passage here dealing with Article 4. Um, and for present purposes, um, the place I need to go to is, is the is paragraph 46, where this court identified um, post Ranciev cases, including the Grand Chamber judgment in SM Croatia, um, and then the summary um, in TDT of the Article 4 duties, a general duty to implement measures to combat trafficking, which is 
this round was the systems duty, the duty to take steps to protect individual victims of trafficking, the protection duty, or sometimes called the operational duty, and a duty to investigate situations of potential trafficking, the investigation duty, or sometimes called the procedural duty. The duties in question are not absolute. What is required will depend on the circumstances of the particular case. Um, now, if there is anywhere an obligation to grant leave to protect an individual um, for whatever purpose, uh, sorry, an individual victim of trafficking for whatever purpose, that would fall uh, under the protection duty or the operational duty, <coughs> uh, the second of those duties. Um, we have been unable to find any clear or consistent authority to the effect that that obligation uh, extends to granting legal residence to an individual. So the obligation under Article 4 of uh, BCHR to grant uh, legal residence to an individual. Um, the most recent, I think it's the most recent um, relevant authority is SM and Grand Chamber, um, paragraph 306 as cited in MN, um, and that deals with the uh, with obligation three about investigation. Um, we respectfully say that uh, although in, there may, in general terms, be a duty to protect, um, this is not a situation in which um, either Strasbourg or the domestic courts have recognised that there is an Article Four ECHR obligation um, that mirrors or reproduces. Um, the ECAT obligations with which we are concerned. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think many of us remember the, the, the famous pair of dicta about um, no less and no more, no more and no less. Um, uh, and that is uh, a dictum, dicta that apply in this situation. Um, there is no basis, we respectfully say, for uh, holding that Article 4 ECHR extends to this kind of obligation. So, we are not in that third way territory. It doesn't. Can I then turn to KTT? Equally crisply, I hope, <coughs> make the points here. Um, first of all, uh, um, the claim. Um, uh, as presented to Mr. Justice Linden um, after what he described as refinement, was a claim to be allowed to become lawfully resident solely in order to make a claim to lawful residence. Because that is the effect of asking for a residence permit uh, to cover the period while your asylum claim is being dealt with. Uh, we've made the observation that this is really a bit like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps um, for reasons <coughs> with uh, which I've uh, argued at length this morning. Well, that, 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 of course, is true. But, of course, if there weren't the systemic delays that we see in the courts day in, day out, we wouldn't be here, would we? Well, <laughs> so it's, it, you can make the point forensically, but in many respects, the remedy doesn't lie with the claimants. Well, th there are... Um, I mean, public law is a field in which there are always many remedies, only some of them are, are legal. And, and, and I, I've said, I, I, I hope, um, uh, in a fair way, um, at the outset, that there are delays and they are regrettable. Um, and, and clearly, if they didn't occur, then people would not be complaining to the courts. I, I, I have to accept that. Well, and the courts wouldn't be dealing with all these claims on a regular basis. And, uh, and people revolving doors where five years before we make a decision, agonise over a decision, and then the person comes back five years later because nothing's been done to remove the person from the jurisdiction. Um, Lord, I, I, can, I can only answer to the legal arguments. Um, I, I appreciate yes. that, but you did make a point about the claimants, as it were, putting themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, um, le legally, l legally that, is the, that is the nature of the... Of, of the but, but Mr Tam, the, the, the point on delay is this, that... Um, all these policies that we were looking at in KTT's case, and by the way, I, I offered you a point earlier which was quite wrong about uh, interim, the word interim, which was I was thinking was about KTT, but you were talking about EOG. So um, we can just...
just uh, scrub that point for EOG's case. But there is a serious point here. These, the policy that we're looking at is drafted on the premise that there will not be systemic delays. And uh, that is a very important um, thing to bear in mind when one is construing what it means. And you play that in aid in your favor. But the fact is that it is hugely unsatisfactory that these cases come forward only because, as my Lord has pointed out, there are systemic delays and there is no policy which deals with those, um, those systemic delays. So that people are put, quite neutrally, I'm not talking about these cases, people who are victims of trafficking are put in very difficult positions because they don't have um, the ability to work over long periods. They don't have leave to remain. And, and for my part, at least, I mean, this case does highlight something that is very unsatisfactory, which, if there were no systemic delays, would not be there. And, I mean, you, you may be entitled to say, I'm not going to answer, as you did to his lordship, um, because that's all about uh, not about the law, but about how unhappy you may be with what actually happens in real life. But it is worthy of comment that this case would never happen if the policy, for which, which apparently was drafted for um, uh, real for for what was intended to happen, namely forty-five days between reasonable grounds and conclusive grounds, etc and then consideration speedily thereafter of asylum, or perhaps even before of asylum, um, which in real life is absurd because we're talking about years for these decisions to be made. Well, Lord, on a, on a practical basis, um, I, I, I don't think that I could uh, properly uh, attempt to offer any uh, response to that. No, except to, to note the frustration of the court. Well, uh, in, indeed, and, um, I, I, and I hope that the court will think that it was appropriate for me to have acknowledged that at the outset. I mean, Mr. Tam, the problem, the problem is, speaking only for myself, that it seems that this whole case has been, these cases have been caused directly by these unsatisfactory delays. And uh, maybe even the decision-making has been caused by a misunderstanding of the policy, thinking that it's supposed to be dealing with periods of long delay, whereas it's, it's, it's obviously not properly there. Well, Lord, um, can I say, we of course have heard all of that. Those uh, uh, of our clients who are watching on the live stream will have heard that. Yeah. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, it will have been heard loud and clear. We entirely understand that. I'm, I'm not here uh, um, as um, some others might be in a different place trying to defend all of the practicalities. I can only answer to the legal points that are being made. But there is one legal point, um, not the practical ones, but the legal point that I can make, which is that if the delays are unsatisfactory, there is potentially a legal remedy for, uh, directly for that. That is the point I made <clears throat> in EOG ground two. It's the delay challenge um, uh, to the decision making. And can I say, I, I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'd be speaking out of turn to say that we have, of course, been here before, albeit a couple of decades ago, um, in the asylum context, um, when there were um, delays in uh, decision making there, uh, and there was um, quite a lot of jurisprudence, which actually took a very long time eventually to, to, to finally get settled about delay and the consequences of delay and so on. Um, so the law does um, uh, <clears throat> start this again. The law does provide remedies for this sort of problem, and the legal point that, that, that I can well, the, uh, the supporting legal point I think I can make is that it wouldn't be right to distort other legal arguments and other parts of our legal structure 
uh, um, uh, to um, provide remedies for the delay where a direct challenge is available and direct remedies are available. And that, I think, in the context of this case, is what I can partly say. From the court's point of view, th then resources are diverted to dealing with delay cases, like O and H, where the Secretary of State perfectly properly and indeed successfully defends a claim on delay in that case. And what we, do we do? We're, we're all arguing about the rights and remedies rather than getting on and deciding the matter. Yes. Um, I well, I, I entirely want, I understand what what my lord puts to. And as I say, that it, it, it has been heard. It will be heard. <clears throat> um, the second point that I was going to make uh, relates to the textual analysis of Article 14. I've shown your worships the, the part of our skeleton argument that deals with that. I really think I've made quite a lot of submissions about that already, including the potential oddity of treating victims of trafficking better than other asylum seekers. Um, so I'm not going to repeat all of those. I've, I've, I've probably said as much as I can usefully say. Well, I'm not quite sure you have. Um, if, if we look at Article 14, right, under the heading Resident Family, um, and I completely understand your point about the choice that is given to um, contracting parties, right? So I, I, I see all that, but I do not see the argument about um, the word necessary uh, not directly governing the word stay. I, I just don't see it. And you know, I've been in the business of constructing and interpreting documents for many years, Mr. Tan. And I read your skeleton with great care, and I didn't get it. So if you want me to get it, you are going to have to argue it orally well, on that I'm, age old tradition. <laughs> yes, well, I'm great, grateful for the indication and the opportunity. Um, the, the way that we put it is this. Um, <clears throat> The, the body of 14.1 refers to issuing a renewable residence permit. Um, and you could read 14.1 um, A and B um, in a way which puts the body of, of the article into each subparagraph. So, uh, shall issue a renewable residence permit to victims if their stay is necessary. Shall issue a renewable residence permit if their stay is necessary. So you, could, you, can, you can do it like that. So the word necessary will appear in the sentence uh, uh, in, in 14.1a as, as thus written out. Um, bearing in mind that this is not to be construed as an English statute. Well, I, 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 mean, I don't even come with you this far. You could read the, the provision as saying, where, leaving out B, where the competent authority considers uh, that a victim's stay is necessary owing to their personal situation, the state shall issue a renewable resident permit. Couldn't you? Right? That, that is a perfectly permissible reading. But that does not disconnect necessary from stay. No, I, I, I accept that. But what it does do is that it infuses the whole of that sentence with, with necessary. What do you mean in people? No. Uh, it, it just necessary does exactly the same work if we do what you say we should do uh, as it does in the thing as drafted. It says it, the crucial question is is the stay <coughs> necessary owing to their personal situation? Well, the so, stay necessary. Well, the, the, this, this is this is my my first submission, which is which is that if if you um, uh, if, if you have it in one sentence like that, um, <coughs> you you are looking. When, sorry, let, let me just just put this in, into the context. As as, uh, as Lord Marshal Rolls put um, uh, to me earlier, there is this this um, chronological progression through this, and we have got to a stage where <clears throat> the contemplation 
is of some sort of longer term stay, not the purely interim. And I can say I, I, it's no, no, interim I either in EOG or not, longer, not the, the longer term um, stay. And so the question is, does this person need a residence permit to stay? You can get that if the stay is necessary and they wouldn't otherwise be able to stay. Uh, so so the, the, the permit is, is necessary. Um, or you can do it by asking yourself, um, or, or rather by, by uh, interpreting the word stay as a longer term stay mm. of, uh, of that kind. Either of those gets me home uh, uh, for the purposes of, of this argument, because on either reading, it doesn't cover KTT. So that is... Well, okay, but it's, it's a different point. It's not it's a, a another point. way of getting to the same point. It is a different point, and one which, I'm frank, I haven't even picked up before. Um, yeah, but, but it is it is sort of there in your skeleton. Yes. We've checked it at lunch. But, <laughs> well, um, you, you pointed it to us this morning. After lunch. A little mercurial, but it is yes. there. But the, but the point my lord makes is 100% correct. It's a completely different point, and not the one that's in your skeleton. And I still don't understand the one that, that you major on in your skeleton. Well, I mean, because the, 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 I mean, even if you say, if, the, if it reads, if the competent authority considers that a, longer sta a long term stay is necessary owing to their personal situation. The contracting party shall issue a renewable residence permit. Um, it still doesn't disconnect necessary um, from the longer term stay. And it, it certainly seems to me that you can argue the longer term stay point. You can argue that this is all discretionary in the competent authority point, which it is. Um, and there seems to be a fairly absolute discretion, except that it has to consider whether it's necessary or not. But I don't see how you get rid of necessary or attach it to the issue of the permit. Well, if, if the court thinks that these are two completely separate submissions, I, I, I don't think I, I should spend more time no, doing no. that. But we would like to, well, being myself, yes. I'd like to really understand it because it is a different thing to say the stay is necessary or say the renewable residence permit, sorry, the I'm renewable not, yes. residence permit is necessary. If, if, if one were passing as a purely English sentence. I mean, leave aside legislation on it, but just as, as a matter of... Have you looked at the French? French? Sorry? Have you looked at the French and the German text? Uh, no, 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 we haven't, because we we have all been, been working at, on, on this, but with the with the uh, our domestic authority on, on, on how to, to, to read this. Um, uh, the... Um, uh, I accept that, it, that, it, that if you passed as, as a purely English sentence, then necessary is attached to stay. Um, we construct our, our argument on two bases. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't mind whether it's looking at it as two, two different ways of looking at the same thing or two entirely different things. One of them is that the, the concept of necessary infuses the whole sentence, and you get that um, uh, by taking the uh, Bob Gill approach to um, statutory construction. Oh, sorry, what the what approach? Uh, Father Gill. Uh, the Father Gill. Yeah, yeah the, the, um, and um, uh, Father Gill and the recent, uh, more recent decision, Nautical Challenge, setting up. The of what? Which is the more recent one? Uh, Nautical Challenge. But it, it largely reiterates Father Gill. Neither would be a chancery case, I guess. Um, I think Nautical Challenge was a shipping case. Fothergill was an airline case. Wasn't it? Yes, Fothergill and Monarch Airlines. I can't remember the, the context. Um, yes, Nautical Challenge, I think the facts were about two ships that hit each other and, and the rules of the road. I'm sorry, I, I'm sure I ought to know. What, 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 why are either Fothergill or Nautical Challenge, what, what's the principle we get from them which would allow you to uh, read this completely differently from how it actually reads? It, it's, it's the basic principle of you can't read treaties like English statutes. Well, <laughs> but in one sense that's true. In another sense, it's, that's that you didn't dumpty dumpty that. Um, you, of course, of course, we all understand there's different legal traditions and so on. But 
You can't start with the words. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to have these words mean something completely different from, from what they mean. What I'm trying, trying to get at is one way of looking at this is, is that if you look at a sentence that has um, uh, issue of renewal or residence permit of stay as necessary, but the concept of the stay, uh, sorry, co the concept of necessity imbues the whole of that sentence. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. The other way, or, or a different way of looking is, uh, which is equally good for all my arguments, is to say that because the stay that is contemplated um, is of a longer term kind, yeah. it is not the kind of stay that KTT is asking for. Uh, and I, either way, um, that um, uh, uh, the, the interpretation of Article 14 should be resolved in our favour. And we're going around the circle. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think I can I no, no, do more than that. You can't make it better. Um, <clears throat> the third point um, is a point uh, about whether um, the uh, sorry, uh, let me restart this again um, whether the principle um, found by Mr Justice Linden uh, that of granting leave to those uh, whose asylum claim is outstanding uh, is limited to those whose claim, asylum claim, is based on a fear of re-trafficking. Um, that is a uh, limitation um, that was accepted by the claimant below. But we respectfully say that that limitation uh, wouldn't be logical because it isn't found in Article 14.1a. It simply refers to necessary due to the pers person's personal circumstances. Isn't a fear of being re-trafficked a personal situation? Uh, the risk of being re-trafficked is as much a personal situation or personal circumstance as um, uh, any of the other potential uh, of an asylum claim. Your, your point is if a victim of trafficking was also by chance a political activist in a repressive country, um, the logic of um, Mr. Butler's position, which the judge accepted, is uh, that it wasn't owing to their personal situation. Um, sorry, that the need not to be sent back or the need, the need to await a decision whether sending back would result in their being persecuted for their political opinion was not part of their personal situation. And you say that's that would be uh, anomalous. And, and, and you also say it would occasionally give rise to difficult inquiries as to um, what their claim really was. That, that's right. Um, so, so, yes, th th there are those, those two separate things. First of all, the, the, the limitation is illogical. So while it may be attractive uh, on a superficial level to have this um, claim to interim DL limited to a certain class of claims, in reality it could not be so limited and is much broader. And second, it would then impose on, uh, if limitation were accepted, it would impose on the Secretary of State uh, an, an obligation to examine the nature of the assignment in each, in, in each You could case. get around that in two ways. One is you could say that um, uh, there's something wrong with the premise, which is how you're using it, or it could be said, all right, what's the problem? Um, if, if, as it happens, the victim of uh, trafficking, untypically, but it will happen, uh, he needs to stay in this country in order to have it determined whether to return them would be a breach of an asylum claim based on something else. That's still part of their personal situation. And why shouldn't Article 14 have been said to cover it? Because it would increase the anomaly as between victims of trafficking who are claiming asylum and asylum seekers who are not victims of trafficking. And, and while I accept it's not impossible, 
that that is the position. Anything that increases the anomaly is, we respectfully say, an indicator that there's something wrong well, with the Can I just try for a slightly different one? It may ultimately be the same purpose, an example I've put to you before lunch. Suppose the personal situation relied on, relied on is a serious illness for which they are receiving treatment in this country. Uh, and uh, they say their stay is necessary so that they can complete that treatment. And suppose the serious illness has nothing to do with their trafficking experience. Is that covered by 14.1a? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, I, I hope it's not um, uh, thought to be ducking the question, but it's certainly covered by our policy. If somebody it is, is ducking is, the question, is, I'm afraid. But, sorry. It is ducking the question. Um, well, uh, in. And is it covered by yes. our policy, out of curiosity? It, it is because medical medical is is a, a standalone um, example. All right. Well, let's assume that's right. But I'm, at the moment, I'm just interested in what the convention means. Well, I, I, I'm I'm not going to argue that a serious illness is not a personal situation. Um, but that well, I is mean, the logic of your previous position is that a personal situation ought to be something that is specific only to um, a victim of trafficking. No, 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 that, no that, that, that's you say that's Mr. Butler's position. That's, that's my own friend's position. Thank you. Um, just the final point about um, having to work out whether, sorry, let me just stop. Somebody says, I'm in the same position as KTT, I'm waiting for a decision on my assignment claim, I would like to have KTT form of interim DL. Um, the consequence is that the decision maker then has to examine the asylum claim to work out whether or not it is based on a fear of, of uh, weed trafficking. <clears throat> uh, sometimes it is not easy to tell. In all cases, that is an additional resource consuming step. And it's a practical point, but it, it would tend to make things worse. And if that is um, uh, uh, piled on top of the illogicality of increasing the anomaly, then that's a pointer to this interpretation. <clears throat> um, we make a, a fourth point um, that uh, Mr. Justice Linden um, was wrong to say that the consequence of our uh, argument is that somebody uh, who is an asylum seeker would be disentitled from leave under Article 14. If you look at our policy, there is nothing in there that would disentitle somebody from getting leave for the purposes of helping with a criminal investigation. Um, so that, we respectfully say, is, uh, is not right. Um, I, I've made the linked point already about Article 14 being complied with by one or the other, so I'm not going to go back to that. And <clears throat> the, the final point is, uh, again, just to mention the fact that there's no consistent state practice, but I think I've shown the court the, the materials there. May I ask a question just on the difference or similarities between asylum seekers and victims of trafficking? At the moment, because of delays in uh, asylum processing, if you have an asylum claim and you're outstanding for a year, you have a right to seek a, a right to work. Is that right? Does that apply to um, victims of trafficking? If they're asylum seekers, yes. If they're asylum seekers, and uh, but if, if if not, then they would just be under a different policy, I suppose. Uh, yes, if they're not asylum seekers, I'm not aware of there being a a, a, a corresponding policy uh, on that. The Annex F in the policy does say something about the right to work. I can't remember exactly what it said, but I, I'm I, I, I'm not um, suggesting it's the same. Thank you. Um, ground two of our appeal in KTT is about the interpretation of policy and whether it includes uh, a policy commitment um, to comply with, with um, ECAT. Um, again, um, I think I have probably said as much as I can usefully say on that in the course of discussions today. Um, so that just leaves me going back to what's ground three in KTT. 
uh, and has um, an impact on EOG as well, which is the justiciability issue. <clears throat> um, uh, I, was, I was asked um, uh, during the short adjournment about our, our position on this. Okay, can, can I ju just, just be clear? Um, uh, Mr. Justice Linden uh, concluded that P.K. Garner was binding, the ratio of P.K. Garner was binding, even though it was by concession, because it was concession that was considered and accepted by the court. Um, if P.K. Garner is, was binding on him, then it must be binding on this court as well, unless I could find a reason for arguing that Mr. Justice Linden was wrong. I can't. So I think the right thing to do is to accept that at this level, E.K. Garner is binding on this court as well. Um, I, 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 I can't remember if I should formally reserve my position in case of uh, further argument elsewhere or in another case, um, but may I please do so? But certainly at this level, um, E.K. Garner is... Could you just, just tell me for my note precisely what is the ratio of E.K. Garner that is binding on? Well, in, in a nutshell, it is that um, uh, the... Uh, Compliance with um, uh, ECAT is justiciable if policy says it's going to comply with ECAT. Sorry, say that again. It's justiciable if, if the policy says it will comply with ECAT. Yeah. Now, I've already made the point about and you um, say you say it whether whether very high level. Um, general statements of policy, especially um, some of the materials of parliamentary statements, um, arguably, that there could be argument about their admissibility um, made all, all over the place. This is not the sort of um, argument that you might have if there were a detailed provision about um, Article 14 and compliance with Article 14 in, in, uh, in this case. But, but um, you say not only high level policies are not sufficient, but it's simply exceeding the treaty where you say tell the world that you're going to comply with it is not sufficient either. Um, no, not for, not for the kind of argument that is being run no. here because otherwise um, uh, what would uh, what the law would be would be that as soon as the government enters into a treaty <clears throat> and or ratifies it then the whole treaty automatically um, uh, becomes um, justiciable through policy. Becomes government policy. And we, we say that that is, that is a step too far. Obviously, there are situations in which it would be, and that's P.K. Garner. Um, but we say that this present situation is not one of those. Um, and so for the reasons I don't, well, I've already argued, I don't think I should repeat, um, we say that we are not in that territory. Just remind me, in P.K. Garner, where did they get the... Uh, or what did they base the conclusion that the uh, policy was to comply with uh, Article 14 of ECAT? I think it was um, based on an express concession made by Ms. Bretherton after taking instructions. Yes. Is that all it was based on? Um, I can't immediately recall the court independently deriving that from other materials. Um, where you do see that process happening is uh, Sir Stephen Silver's judgment in Galdicas, where this point, or the justiciability point, was taken and pursued. Uh, and in his judgment, uh, this will be uh, Authorities 1, tab 3, page 135. 135 is where you'll find it. At paragraph 66, he explains <coughs> in some detail where he uh, derived the uh, justiciability from. And it included, for example, between letters G and H, a witness statement from uh, a big Home Office official. This, was this about Article 14? No, it wasn't about Article 14. Well, but PK is about Article 14. Sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. And that, that, that was by concession. Uh, and, 
as I say, I, I don't immediately recall the court having independently uh, listed other material after the concession of the appeal. The, the concession is not relevant to what we have to decide. We have to decide whether there's been an acceptance in this policy or material that applies here. Yes, but might it be said this? I think the policy in um, PK Ghana was not this actual document. It was an earlier <coughs> version. <coughs> subject to anything you may say, got it, but subject to anything you may say of substantially the same effect. Might it be said that if counsel for the Secretary of State in the Court of Appeal? Um, <coughs> says in terms that it is the policy of the Secretary of State to apply 14.1a, um, that that is an independent basis on which uh, a subsequent publication of a substantially identical policy uh, should be interpreted in the same way. I'd like you to be in a concession just for the purpose of the case. I appreciate that's the context, but it is a statement of government policy, isn't it? I'm trying to find out, in trying to find out where actually she says it. I've been listening to you and haven't been able to focus on it. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, that is um, paragraph 34, page 158. Oh, here we are, thank you. Yes, I see. Well, that is entirely general. Mm. But it is then applied to the case before them, which is a case about Article 14. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I... I um, the, the one thing that I would say is, um, just as a immediate reaction to the point the Lord puts to me is that it would be um, quite startling if counsel's concession within the confines of a case in which they're instructed then necessarily held to bind the Secretary of State in or for all future purposes on that point. No, I think that is probably right. If you were to say, and perhaps this is what you have said, that the concession in PK Ghana that uh, 40, that fourteen uh, one a was to be construed. Um, the intention was to follow fourteen one a to apply fourteen one a, and that therefore um, it must be construed so as to achieve conformity with it. Um, was it a concession that you did not make in this case? Uh, I suppose that's the answer, which I think is quite useful to know that explicitly. That is what you're saying, really. You're not making the concession that was made in that case. Well, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm, I'm looking back again at the terms of the recorded concession. Yes. Well, as I pointed out, yes. it, the concession was entirely general terms, but it's got to be read in context. The whole case was about 14.1a. And therefore, it was in practice a concession about 14.1a. It could be read as if, if, it, if uh, the uh, guidance in the relevant respect failed to give effect to Article 14.1a, then that would be a justiciable error of law. Well, I, 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 can, I can see the possibility of reading it like that. And if that specific question is asked of me, I, I don't think that you're I should be making right. that concession without a specific instruction to do well, so. You, you told me this morning you weren't. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. And, 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 and <laughs> I, and I'm just rubbing it in. But, I mean. <laughs> um, uh, but not only that I'm not, but that I shouldn't without having specific no, instructions. You have plenty of time to get specific instructions. Yeah. I, I can't believe you've come to this appeal with PK Ghana, paragraph 34 up there, the Secretary of State conceded. Um, and you haven't discussed whether you have those instructions or not. I'm not for a moment asking for details of that. 
but it's hardly it was hardly unlikely to be asked of you. Well, um, what what I, I can I can say is that after having considered the way that Mr. Justice Lyndon dealt with it and his um, conclusion um, that P. K. Garner was binding on him and the um, logical next step, which is that it is binding on this court as well, then that is the position that that I adopt. I, I thought that it would be a way of removing one issue from the case. I know, and but, the, the position, sorry, but the position you adopt is the one you uh, said when I asked you what the ratio of P.K. Garner was, namely that the P.K. Garner ratio is that compliance with ECAT is justiciable if the policy says it will comply with ECAT. It doesn't tell you what my lords are asking you about, uh, which is whether the concession um, that the Secretary of State has said that uh, she will comply with ECAT is still extant. And the answer is obvious because you told me this morning it was not a case. Yeah. I mean, you look doubtful, but. Uh, well, I, I, yes, I, I don't those, think I. Those behind you look less doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think I can, I can take it any further than, than what I've already said. But, uh, sorry, sorry to press, but I mean, just for the accuracy of, of my note. Part of um, P.K. Garner includes paragraph 34, mm -hmm. which you've now just said is binding on us. But, but that also refers to a concession that you, you don't want to repeat. So um, there seem to be two horses that you can ride from the, out of paragraph 34, and which one are you going with? Yes, I, I, I see. I, I see the point. Um, sorry, look, looking at paragraph thirty-four, I see the point that, that, that Lord is, is making. Um, the, 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 the concession um, in paragraph thirty-four. Um, Is, I, I think if, if I have to be specific about this, then, then the concession in paragraph 34 is probably something that I should not, is something that I should not be departing from. Well, so, I understand. In, in, inevitably, in oral argument, um, we learn a lot more, and sometimes issues become clearer to you. It, it sounds as if you're getting to the stage where you need to get some proper instructions on this point. Well, uh, I would be grateful for that opportunity. Um, uh, in order to make sure that our but positions are right. Can I just spell it out? I probably remember us already here. There are, in fact, what I am putting to you, mm. two concessions analytically, para 34. One, the point of principle, <coughs> which is that if the policy says it will comply with ECAT, then uh, whether it in fact does so is justiciable. That's the one you've certainly said um, that you are prepared to stick with. The second, which is uh, not, I accept, explicit in the words recorded here, but I'm putting to you is clearly implicit in the whole course of the way the case was argued uh, in, in, in um, BK Ghana, was that Article 14.1a was, um, I'm sorry, that the policy uh, as regards to discretionary leave, was intended to comply with ECAT 14.1a. That is the second part of the concession, yes. and that is equally important. Uh, and uh, speaking for myself at the moment, I have no doubt that that was also conceded, and then they went on to argue whether it was actually different. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I would like to know whether you're conceding that as well. I, I suspect you're not, because it would be contrary to what you've been saying up to this point. But I think it is important yes. no, I, I, to I, know. I can, I can see that if one drills down to that, that the implicit concession there, that that is something which it would be right for me to clarify. Well, um, certainly I would need you to, because my un clear understanding up to now 
is that what my Lord has expressed as the second implicit concession was not being made in this case. Um, so I think you'll need to take some instructions if you want to submit the opposite. I, I will, and I, I'm grateful for the, for, for the exchange because that, that's um, identified the two separate points, as Lord, Lord Justice Underhill has, has yeah. said. Um, and but then there is a point. The reason my pressing is at this stage, in the sense, is, oh, I, I think I can predict what your answer will be, but it will be relevant the question of whether we're bound by BK Brown. Because if, if the concession formed part of, was, as Mr. Justice Linden said, uh, taken up into the ratio and specifically adopted by um, the court, then it's not good enough for you to withdraw it because you have a binding decision against you. And um, there may right. be an answer to that, but I think we would need to know exactly what we were dealing with. Yes. Are you then saying, as you've said in your skeleton, that the whole thing is po imperio SC? But, um, I mean, well, I po now made, now, now made not binding by SC anyway, I don't think it's po imperio, in fact, it can't possibly be. But, the, but, but um, we need to know what your submissions are. I mean, to, to my way of thinking, this, the second point, my Lord put to you is absolutely critical to this case because if if it is accepted that you have the Secretary of State intended by the policy to give effect to Article 14.1a after you have just told me that the contents of the policy do not have anything to do with Article 14.1a despite the, the um, wording being similar because it's about um, well, no, no that's, about, that's not really a fair characterization, but you've explained to me how it's not dealing with the situation in this case, but it's dealing with the long-term situation. If that's your case, um, it's hardly consistent with the proposition that you intended to give effect to 14.1a, whatever it says. I mean, it, it seems likely that after the decision in PK, the whole thing was revisited because um, Lord Justice Higginbottom and the Court of Appeal quashed the existing policy. So it may be that, that, that matters changed, but um, it, we need to know that, obviously. We haven't looked. I haven't, for one, have not looked at the policy that was in issue. Being myself, PK. I think formally we should look at it because it had a different the defect was a different one. The test of necessary was glossed as meaning the need for compelling circumstances. And what they said is compelling circumstances in this area of the law basically means it must be highly exceptional. And uh, that, that was going further than the, um, than the convention went. And so we can assume, we obviously know that the version they were looking at was different in that it had that gloss. But whether the rest of it was any different, I'd rather you can doubt. But we, it can easily be resolved by showing it to us. Perhaps we ought to just see it now. Yes. Um, I'll just check to see. Um, I think we, I think paragraph 18 deals with the, the policy, I think, at the time. It was a 2013 policy. <coughs> that is um, at uh, it's policy bundle one. Yes, that's right. Yes, but that refers to a discretionary leave policy, C-related link. That's actually set out in 
para 19 UK Ghana. We got that. Well, maybe all we need is in, the, is in PK Ghana, but well, we want to see the whole thing. Looking at page 397, is that where we are supposed to be looking? It's the heading personal circumstances. Yes, well, that, that's the part of the policy which was an issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As you see, the heading on that page is discretionary leave on grounds of personal circumstances or to pursue compensation. Yes, but it may be appropriate to grant a victim of trafficking discretion to use their personal services are compelling and like medical treatment. And in the next sentence, this must be considered in line with the discretion we need policy. See what it says. And the related link is said by Augustus Hickingbottom to be an asylum policy instruction on discretion we need, um, uh, version 6. Is that in the bundle? <coughs> I'm, I'm, told, I'm told that the next version of the sign policy instruction is uh, tab 8, page 575. This is volume 2. Yeah, that's well, that may have changed. 2015. Yes. I mean, this is all a bit unsatisfactory, um, Mr. Tan. Um, and I think we need an answer to the question we have posed. Um, and I think we need it on instruction. And it's half past three. How much more have you got um, absent this point? Uh, absent this point, um, not, not much, actually. Um, so uh, would it assist if I skipped over this and, and completed the, the submissions. Um, and then you can come back to this in the morning when you've had an opportunity to take instructions. I mean, having just, just adjourning for 10 minutes with only a few people available to you is not satisfactory. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, no, I mean, it's not satisfactory just to give you 10 minutes to oh, take instructions. Well, I, I'm grateful. Yes. So you finish your, the rest of your submissions. <coughs> Hold you to the last word. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> the, the 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 final step is that if um, uh, there isn't a policy route um, to making um, the uh, meaning of the of ECAN justiciable, uh, then we are indeed in the forbidden territory uh, of uh, attempting directly to apply um, the unincorporated treaty, and that is clearly not permitted um, because of International Tin Council at sea. Uh, and we say that one of the things that is clear from Mr. Justice Mostyn's decision um, when we were all less aware of this point is that that is exactly what he had done, which is say, here's a problem that needs solving. Article 10.2 uh, uh, requires a certain thing to be done, and this policy Secretary of State's policy doesn't comply with this. She needs to make a new policy because it's unlawful not to. Um, and, and that is why uh, I think I used the phrase of forbidden chasm earlier, that um, he's definitely taken a leap across that. I accept that, of course, Mr. Justice Linden was um, uh, much more nuanced in his approach and he based it on policy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you are with me on my submission that um, the policy did not require um, uh, the um, uh, that, um, ECAT, Article 41F, uh, be absolutely complied with, then um, the logical conclusion must be that E2 uh, um, fell into error in uh, doing that which is not permitted.
Mark just happened. So unless I can assist any further with this off, um, uh, then we will go and take the instructions that are necessary to give the court a clear answer about... What, I, what I'm concerned about, Mr. Stanley, is you haven't really dealt with the, <clears throat> the other materials that are said to make Article 14 um, part of the policy. Well, our, our, our simple um, answer to that is they don't. Um, uh, uh, and um, the respondents and the intervener um, are the ones who are, are parties who are arguing that there is such a, an obligation. For the appellant, and, and as you say, Ms. Justice Linden looked at this very thoroughly at 60 to um, 60 to 80, 60 to 79. I'm not I'm inviting you to take us precisely through that, but you simply say the various matters he referred to there don't get him home, or you want to be more precise? I mean, article, paragraph 75, <coughs> it seems to me to be inescapable that leave is necessary owing to personal circumstances category in version 2 of the policy is intended to reflect article 14. And I discuss whether it does so accurately below. I mean, I'm just, just picking bits at random. I mean, he certainly took the view. But you just say, well, it doesn't, and I've already been through it, and I've shown you it doesn't. Yes, I mean, look, I've, I've, I've really given the court the answer to that specific point, which is, of course, we recognise that, um, that what is in the um, MSL policy recognisably Includes um, cases that fall within 14.1a. So this, this is this is not a question of the secretary of, of, of the secretary of state's policy, the MSL policy, simply being completely divorced from Article 14. It's never been our submission. The the, um, the the what is being said against me is that the two areas don't match. They overlap, but they don't match. That is fundamental. The, 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 the complaint that's being that, that is being made um, and uh, it would be necessary for there to be shown uh, some material um, that by what which do you mean by the two areas the premise of the argument uh, especially on article 14 the premise of the argument is that Article 14.1a requires a grant of leave in a particular area, as described by 14.1a, <clears throat> and that the Secretary of State's policy does not cover that area. And KTT's case, it is said, falls within uh, an area which is required, which is um, covered by 14.1a, but not covered by the policy. And that is, that, that's a subject of Argument. Um, and, uh, and and well, I've, I've made the submissions on, on the, gen the, the very mm -hmm. general level of the materials. Uh, I'm subject to the instructions which I'm going to take tonight. Well, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that that, that is the entire argument. The argument is that the policy, when read with the proper meaning of Article 14, does give effect to Article 14, and you have not followed the policy. I mean, that's the first argument. Uh, and then you may come to some slightly more recherche points if that's wrong. But you, you, you know, starting from the premise that you're wrong about the, the first construction, point about um, longer term, but the construction point about necessary. Starting from that premise, they say it doesn't mean what you 
stay. Necessary is linked to stay, and stay applies to any stay, and uh, therefore KTT should have uh, leave, and under the policy. And, and I mean, that may be right, it may be wrong, but the point is that's what the case you have to me. It's, it's not just a question of saying that it requires a grant of leave and the policy doesn't cover that area. That's, that's maybe a secondary. I think that is ground, whatever that, that's secondary ground. Well, um, if if the court were to conclude, it's entirely hypothetical. Yeah. But if if, uh, um, if the court were to conclude that um, the uh, the the adjective necessary governs stay and only stay, and stay uh, is to be interpreted as including the kind of uh, interim uh, leave pending leave that KTT is seeking. Um, uh, and the um, the question of whether that is compatible with Article 41A is justiciable by this court. Um, then, um, uh, then my argument would fail. My appeal would fail. Your appeal fails whether it's justiciable or not, because it's the meaning of the policy. Because the the policy says expressly that necessary governs stay. Right? No, um, with respect, no. The, the, the policy. Uh, sorry, sorry. Leave, leave aside right, a 41 right. a, Yes, right. leave is yeah. no, the leave is necessary. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, yes, I see that. I see that. Well. Yeah, I've just been. Reminding myself of how Mr. Justice Lindon does deal with the point in the paragraphs I referred you to, and it is largely based on the, the, the policy you took us to this morning, and uh, the various concessions made in the past, most sp and specifically PK Garner, because that is one was a case about Article 14. He doesn't, I think, refer much to, uh, certainly his primary argument is not based on uh, anything else, although he does make more general points at 77 about um, that your broad policy has always been to comply with it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, I think with that, probably we are beginning to go round in circles ourselves, and it's best that you uh, take time to get proper and clear instructions. And I think the instructions must include the status of PK Garner in your submission, um, as well as the position of Article 15 and its justiciability before this court. Uh, 14. 14. Okay. Well done, great. Then we'll adjourn unless um, colleagues have any to say. We'll adjourn until 10.